So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hello, USA. <laughs> <laughs> this um, is USA. It, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm so happy and excited to be here because I'll share a little secret. Um, I really don't like regular meetings. And this one uh, promises to be one that's going to be very, very different. Yeah. Um, I'm honored to be here with Risa uh, to talk about uh, her perspectives and our foundation's commitment mm -hmm. to nursing. So um, let's get started. Okay. Risa, you know, the, one of the things that I think has been very central in the findings of the IOM report mm -hmm. Um, and that got a lot of attention for reasons that we all understand is the whole notion of um, scope of practice and uh, you know nurses practicing to the full extent of their capacities. Mm. Um, and there's some people, I think they're called physicians, Ooh. who sometimes have a little <laughs> difficulty with that. Um, and you're a physician, so tell me about your perspective, why, why it's different from that of, of many. Yeah. in your profession? Well, uh, I am a physician. I'm proud to be a physician. I'm also someone who came from a medical family and learned very early on the power of interprofessional teams. I had the, the great privilege of watching my mother at a clinic in Seattle, uh, the Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, as it was called then, work with uh, nurses and social workers. Yay! Oh! <laughs> Washington uh, State and Seattle Washington in the house. Washington State. Um, work with inter in an interprofessional team in the late 60s, early 70s. And so I saw up close and personal the power of harnessing the work of a team and people working uh, at the full extent of their, their education and training. And then I'm a geriatrician. And again, I, I don't think in my professional life I've ever practiced in a setting where we weren't drawing on the expertise of multiple uh, professions and disciplines. And so it taught me that you really do your best when you work with a team. And so I've, I guess I've just instilled that in all that I do. And I think that the way that healthcare is moving increasingly the naysayers, and unfortunately, too many of them are physicians, but they, they come in all corners of uh, our healthcare world, will see the power of, of teams, of interprofessional collaboration, and of all of us working to the full extent of our training and practice. So in your experience, was there, can you tell us about a time when you saw that uh, teamwork really can make a difference for patients? I, I, I remember a patient, and I love to talk about her. Uh, it was a patient in Philadelphia, a teacher, former teacher who had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And this was a very determined woman, as many, patient, many teachers are, who said, I want to stay at home no matter what. I want to live at home. And we were a team of, of professionals from across a number of different uh, hospital systems that decided we could come together as a team, as a virtual team really, and do what she wanted us to do, which was to allow her to be cared for and to live at home. And so I was uh, the primary care physician. I made house calls with the nurse practitioner. Um, there, were, uh, there was a rehabilitation uh, specialist from another health system, Jefferson. Her neurologist was also from Jefferson. We had a fabulous uh, home health team that was from a, an agency that wasn't connected to any of us. And together, we were a virtual team that was focused on one goal, making sure that this patient was able to live and, and ultimately to die the way that she wanted to. So was she, she was able to stay home? It, it worked well for her? It, it was, Linda, it was incredible. Uh, she had a, a straw fashioned by the rehab specialist that she could blow on because in the end, she could move her finger just a little bit like that and she could move her eyes. 
she could blow on this straw and let us into her house. But that was really all she could do physically. Wow. Mentally, she was able to do exactly what she wanted to do. So we were able to, as I said, stay committed to her goal and to ultimately allow that system to come together. So when I think about the boundaries that were crossed there, the uh, challenges that were overcome, the boldness that it took to uh, defy, in a lot of ways, the, the ordinary structures, I become absolutely confident that when we put the patient first, we can work across boundaries and be successful. So fast forward to now and to the constituency of nurses in the room. Mm -hmm. How do they move that? What's their role? Why are they the linchpins in kind of making that seamless teamwork happen? I think that when we look at a room like this, and I got a chance to walk uh, and talk to some people, you have people who understand that fundamentally, who, un who understand that nursing and nurses and the, the skills that you bring are often the glue uh, and the vision and the caring that can allow that kind of a system to be put into place. And so it's that understanding that to me is what we've got so powerfully in this room and why without the expertise of the nurses and the profession that are in this room, we're not gonna get to a place where the healthcare system is truly able to deliver high quality, high value care to everyone who needs it. Sue talked about the substantial investment that the foundation has made in the nursing profession dating back to when it started. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about where that all started and how, yeah. why mm -hmm. the foundation is com so committed yeah. to this area? Well, we started in 1972. Uh, that was when our foundation started. How many of you remember some of what was going on in 1972? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I, I can tell you, I can remember too. We were, we, remember, we thought healthcare reform was right around the corner. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then there were some political things that happened and derailed that. But that caused our foundation to say what we as a nation are saying right now. There's no way that we're going to be able to provide quality care to the people who are going to be newly insured unless we change the way our workforce is structured and the kinds of opportunities that we have within our workforce. And that caused the foundation to invest in primary care and also to invest in some of the very first nurse practitioner programs. And now, all these years later, we're saying to ourselves, we're really at that threshold now, but we know so much more than we did in 1972. So I think we really are at a point where we can know how to transform our healthcare system because we've got the people trained to do it. So we really are, that's, there's really a continuum here um, from where we started and helped to build the field of uh, nursing in the direction of the nurse practitioner model. Um, why did we go forward in 2008? Mm. I think it was about 2008 when we started all the planning um, with a future of nursing report. What prompted that? In a lot of ways what prompted it was a sense of frustration that we needed to pull a lot of information together. As, as Sue mentioned, we had been really ramping up uh, the work that the foundation was doing with all of you and others to try to transform nursing. And we had a lot of answers to questions that were here and there. And we realized that you needed to have a place where people could go and see a synthesis of the problems and a blueprint for where we needed to go in one place. And the place that it needed to be had to come from someone or, or an organization that was authoritative and we knew would do a rigorous job of synthesizing all that information. And that's really what the IOM does bet, better than anyone else. 
We also knew that it was a time when our healthcare system was really at a crossroads. People were talking very seriously about changing the healthcare system again, and uh, we really, you know, that had a lot of fits and starts, right? But it was closer than we'd ever been. There was a sense that the old ways just weren't going to work anymore. Uh, people were really frustrated with the quality of care that we were getting for the amount of money that we were spending. So all of these things coming together, a change in the environment and a real sense that the nation was ready for change and that we had answers that weren't in one place caused us to say, let's, let's put it in one place, let's create a future that people will be able to galvanize around mm -hmm. and move towards uh, together. So we, we really do have sort of the, the perfect storm. We've got, um, the, we do have the Affordable Care Act and the likelihood of lots more people coming into the system. Um, we, of course, still have the demographics that are reality in terms of the aging of the population and becoming more diverse. Um, we've got technology and, and just increasing longevity. Uh, and then we've got this problem of cost that I think is kind of front and center today uh, over someplace down the street. Um, <laughs> because Time of what's magazine, a, Right, yeah. Time Magazine, uh, cover story about the bitter pill of, of our health care costs. So this really is a time when all, it's like a perfect storm and a, a perfect opportunity. I, I would frame it as a perfect opportunity in the sense that we have a body of knowledge that tells us really how things can change to create that more perfect healthcare system and community that allows people to be healthy. We know that we know the role that nurses play. We have strong evidence for that. We know some of the things that can be put into place from a systems perspective to improve the quality of care. We, as you said, are much more connected than we've ever been, and we have better ability to use data and to do uh, big data across states, across uh, communities than we've ever had before. So all of those things, I think, give us the opportunity to do what you're going to do so well this uh, next two days, is learn from each other and create a movement for change. So a lot of what has to happen with change is that people have to change, mm -hmm. and people don't. <laughs> and, um, mostly we, we, we say, yeah, we need change, and somebody else over there is, is supposed to You need to, to change, not me. <laughs> um, in your experience, what is it that, yeah. that it really takes to, um, to make change, and in the foundation's experience, because we've had some success in changing, making yeah. some big changes. Well, one of the things we've, we've learned is that uh, you don't create change by saying it must be done this way or the way we say. Uh, change comes from people who are very close to the problem, understanding what needs to happen. We can help build awareness. And when we look at some of our successes and say, uh, helping the movement of smoking cessation come to uh, the point where smoking is not just a glamorous thing that people do uh, uh, right. on, in the movies, and uh, it, but is something we realize is bad for your health, or we look at what has happened with childhood obesity or with coverage. It, it happened because we, we were able to create awareness, but it really happened because there was action on the ground. And so I think that's one of the key things that we've learned is the work that you're doing is absolutely critical to creating that change. You talked a little earlier about um, reaching across boundaries. Mm -hmm. And um, can you expand on that idea a bit? Because I know that we all understand that, especially in a complicated health system, um, everybody does have a role to play, specific. Uh, it's, it's maybe narrow and very deep. And so it's, it's tough for people to reach across and get outside of uh, their usual roles. Yeah. If you look at any of the successful changes um, that have happened in uh, major social movements, they've happened because the, the people that were very close to it understood what needed to happen. But they also were able to create partnerships with strange bedfellows, with people that weren't 
the usual allies. And those people were able to convince others, often outside of their sector, to help with that change. You know, uh, someone who's a very good friend of mine talks about how leadership is about relationships and that in order for nursing to change, you have to be able to get out of your comfort zone and be bold. So I think the, the, whether you study the nursing movement or any other, tobacco, uh, coverage, the, some of the quality movements, they happen because people get outside of their original sector and convince others to carry the message along with them. Okay, so I want to go over this again because I think these points are really important. Um, you talked about the, the key, a key piece is building partnerships and um, getting, reaching out to people you don't usually reach out to, right? Yeah. Um, what about goal setting and having a plan? Okay, so I, that, having relationships is key. But I think there are a few other things that are mm -hmm. absolutely critical as well. And let me just run through a few of them. Okay. You mentioned the first one, I think, having a goal and setting those goals, making the, being very transparent about that. You know, you, you don't know where you're going unless you say where you're going. And you certainly aren't gonna know that you're there unless you've set a goal. So that's, that's absolutely critical. I mentioned being transparent about it and communicating where you are planning to go. This is a, a lesson that we learned at RWJF uh, just a few years ago when we started being very transparent about what we thought the goals ought to be. And all of a sudden, people were pulling with us. And I think that transparency and being strategic about communicating is critical. Building the evidence. Uh, part of the reason that we are sitting here as a community of change right now is because there has been a 40 or 50 year building of evidence about where, what nurses contribute, what cost quality to public health. Building the evidence is, is absolutely essential if you're going to create change. Being persistent and bold. Um, none of these things happen overnight but you have to keep building on the successes and learning from the failures. If there are no failures, you haven't been bold enough. So I think that it's a, it's a combination of goals, being very visible about those goals, building the evidence towards them, and just doing it uh, with those partners that you have created and those strange bedfellows who now are your allies. Okay, that's quite a prescription. Uh for change and, and quite a challenge. Um, this where, group is up to it. They're up to it, okay. <laughs> where should they start? What's the, the first step? I mean, do you, what, where would you begin if you're at square one? Well, I think first of all, setting the goals. Setting the goals, making sure that you have the relationships in place. That is really what this conference is about and what all of these action coalitions uh, are, are already doing. So I think those are the starting points, but that's just the starting point. And one of the things I want you to do, I might as well get my plug in, is to tell us your stories. We'll be coming after you all day long, because you know, spreading the information is a key point too. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about progress. Mm. Um, have you heard any rumblings about what's going on? with these folks? Well, first of all, um, let's just take a moment and recognize that there are 50 states in the District of Columbia yeah. represented in, in this room. <laughs> and when we started, there were none. <laughs> so that in and of itself is huge progress. And then as I talk to you, talk to Sue, talk to people in this room, there, there are some very great examples of these kinds of strange uh, bedfellow alliances coming together. I, I have to give a shout out to our home state, New Jersey, where uh, <laughs> all of the magnet hospitals came together and said they were gonna support 
the state implementation plans. Now, why is that important? Number one, it's the, it's the hospitals that are most uh, revered in the state, the ones that do the best job of delivering high quality care and making the environment good for nurses, and they are saying, we're willing to put our money where our mouth is. In some ways, it doesn't matter how much money, it is the fact that they are the ambassadors for what needs to go forward, and that is a huge message. So that's, that's one example. Mm -hmm. And then I go to Texas, and, <laughs> don't uh, don't, and you've been told, you told me, don't mess with Texas, right? There you go. Uh, a partnership that involves physicians, we were talking about how physicians are sometimes not as friendly, economists, building the evidence when you've got an economist who's working in your strategic alliance, you can uh, really start to, to tell the numbers story. But then also business leaders, leaders from tech companies, computer companies, and helicopter companies, when you get that kind of a, a coalition coming together and saying, you know what, we can solve the problems in a way that is uniquely um, possible in Texas, that to me is the kind of change that really invigorates me. And then, you know, we have states like Nebraska and Maryland who are looking for their own special ways to deal with the problem. So to me, what is energizing me is that all of you are here, all 50 states and the District of Columbia, and that all of you know what needs to be done in your state and you have the power to find those solutions. That's what really energizes me. There is a degree, though, uh, as in any big challenge of, of risk. And is th this is one that RWJF is taking on, but what, why? Why are you so deeply committed to this? And, and when, you know, it could go either way, different direction. Yeah, you know, uh, I look at it this way. We, uh, we can't afford not to do this as a country. Uh, I referenced earlier the, the fact that we are becoming a more diverse uh, society. We have more people who need coverage, but also we have more people who need to live a healthier life. And we know that that can only happen if we invest in our communities and in our healthcare system. We are, uh, I want to leave some time for questions, but a couple other points. Um, one of the hallmarks of our work has always been sticking with it, sticking with it for the long mm. haul. Um, can we talk for a minute about one of our programs, uh, the Nurse Family yeah. Partnership that falls into that category? How many of you have heard of the Nurse Family Partnership? Great, well let me just uh, tell me, it's one of the, the programs that I'm, most proud of because we have a 40-year history, almost a 40-year history with that program. It started out as an idea that just a few people had to try to improve the, the ability of young moms, often teenage mothers, to uh, really parent. And the, the program took a nurse, public health nurse, into that young mom's home for two years and really taught her how to be a parent, but also encouraged her to get schooling, to, uh, to think beyond what she had thought before. And we evaluated it at 5, 10, 15, 25 years and found that, you know what? The mothers had more education, there was less child abuse, there, was, there were fewer problems with the teenagers, and then those kids grew up to be productive uh, kids, uh, adults and parents themselves. Over that period of time, we saw states getting involved in this, funding it. But the real success came when the stimulus bill a couple of years ago invested $10 billion in that program so that all over the country there could be nurse family partnerships, nurses going in and really changing the lives of not only an, an individual but whole families and communities. We stuck with that program. You heard how we've stuck with nursing. Our, we believe that it takes tenacity, um, and that is the comparative advantage that a foundation like ours has, is that we can take the long view, and we absolutely intend to take the long view with you. Okay.
women make, uh, what does success look like? Well, I, success quite succinctly looks like the implementation of the future of nursing. Uh, it looks like people really across America practicing to the full extent of their uh, training and education. It looks like a diverse nursing uh, workforce that is really able to start with a baccalaureate degree, continue to grow and provide the kind of care that we know is going to evolve over our lifetimes and beyond. It, it looks like, frankly, a country that is really invested in being healthy and having a health care system and communities that see us as needing to have a culture of health. You know, one of the people I was talking to recently said, well, Risa, what does that really feel like? And I said, it feels like us as a nation having the kind of values where we can say health and the policies and practices that go into making sure that we are a healthy community are as much a part of us as the values that say we pursue uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Having that kind of a future is what I think nursing and this future of nursing can help us get. And one final thing. Now, you've given us a destination right. where we want to get to. Um, any parting advice as we begin this journey from your perspective? I, I have to um, tell you this, this little story about um, a, a walk that I took uh, a few years ago. Just about the time we were uh, embarking on our 40th anniversary, and uh, I had been in the job about 10 years and was really looking for a, uh, a big walk to do. I love to hike. And so I decided Kilimanjaro, climb Kilimanjaro. I she trained really for did. it, uh, walked back and forth as both Sue and, and uh, Linda know from home to the office with a 40 pound backpack on my, my back to get trained for it. And then I remember standing at the base of Kilimanjaro and looking up at the summit and thinking, oh my, uh, this is gonna be interesting. But I had my daughter with me, and uh, I learned a few things about that. I learned that it's important to have a goal and to understand that if you set the goal and keep changing your measures towards that, you can get there. That it's important sometimes to understand how to pace yourself. You have to know when to go slow when to maybe pause and redirect so that you don't have to stop altogether. That it's critically important to know who you can depend on and to trust those people, to build those relationships. You don't get to the top of a mountain without depending on other people. And I realize that so often to achieve an important goal like that, you have to get out of your comfort zone. If you stay in your comfort zone, you aren't going to get to the summit. And that is true for Kilimanjaro as it is for this summit. So I wish you lots of out of your comfort zone kinds of activities here. So to the summit and to our summit. Great. Um, thank you so much, Risa. Thank you. Don't go. Nope. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Now I get hard questions. That's right. Um, we have just a couple minutes for questions, and we had got, I know we've answered many of the ones that were submitted. So if anyone has a question for us, you're on. There's someone in the back over there. Cheryl Schmidt in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I was a diploma grad in 1970, and in 71 and 72, my BSN, uh, there it's on. Um, I spent two summers in Appalachia with interprofessional teams of students. It was actually funded by Kellogg at the time. We and, love Kellogg. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I was the nurse, obviously, and there were medical students, pharmacy, social work, dental, and I think health ed. And I remember learning how to work with a team then, and it was all the rage, and they had these doctor-nurse partnerships. And then it sort of disappeared, and then a few years ago reappeared like, oh, brand new idea. Well, it's been around a long time. <laughs> um, and, and I think the key was getting us when we were students. Yes. We were young, impressionable, willing to try new things. And I think if we wait until people are out in practice and get independent, it's too late. So I think we need to start in our medical schools, nursing schools, all the health professions to get them out there in interprofessional practice early. 
I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, the, que the, the point was that starting uh, to have people learn how to work in teams at an early stage in their career mm -hmm. is absolutely critical. And I, I absolutely agree with you. I would just add, it's important for us as uh, change agents, as a community of change agents, to look at all the ways that we can build that into every stage of uh, the development of our next generation of professionals. Because if we teach them how to work in teams in school, and then they go to uh, their first clinical setting, and they have right. all of that undermined, it won't take long for them to revert back to the practices that they see in front of them. And, it, and by the same token, if our plans and, and other organizations aren't reinforcing through uh, uh, reimbursement policies and the like, the ways in which teams can work together, they're going to devolve away from those skills. So it's critical to start early, but it's also important for us to build that in at every stage along the way. Okay. Um, one more. Way in the back. Good morning. My name is Barbara Trehearn, and I'm from uh, Seattle, Washington, oh. and <laughs> Odessa Brown Clinic. And um, <laughs> um, I wonder if you might comment on some of the recent commentary we've heard from professional medical organizations about the role or lack thereof of nurse practitioners in leading medical homes. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about that and how you see um, our opportunity for response to those issues. It's, uh, it's a pretty interesting phenomenon, I think. Yeah. Uh, two things I would, I would say going back to that list of, of things to create change. One is to tell the stories. All of you know of stories that are positive where Teams are coming together, they're working very effectively, and they're delivering high quality results. Nothing changes minds better than a story that is local to them, personal to the environment to try to counteract that. And we've seen some of that in very effective stories in the New York Times and other places that I know went viral when they were published. The second thing is continue to build the evidence. A lot of the evidence that we have about the role that nurses play in teams and the, the uh, spectacular results that are delivered, whether it is in uh, transitions to care, various primary care settings, are based on uh, data that's getting old. We know the system is going to continue to evolve. You have to continue to measure those outcomes and publish them so that it's current. So, continue to evolve the evidence and continue to tell it in a very personal, engaging way. I think people relate to that and it can make a difference. And go Odessa Brown. Okay. And you know, I, I wanna make one comment about that, that um, one of the things I've done in the course of trying to, from a communications perspective, drill down into this work is I've asked, my husband is disabled, I spend a lot of time in a lot of hospitals and with doctors, and I ask them these questions about are you, what do you think about nurse practitioners and, and teamwork? And somewhat to my surprise, every physician I've talked to says that's fine with me, and I said no, and I've pushed them, you know, are you, are you scared they're coming after? No, they're not. So I think that there's, um, there may be an organized stance that says there's limits and there have to be these divisions, but I think in practice, a lot more of that collaborative piece is, collaborative spirit is there than we may realize. Um, do we have anybody else who wants a question? Or you want us to wrap up, don't you? One, One more? more, oh good. Okay. Hi, I'm Ann Carey from Louisiana. Risa, uh, thank you uh, for sharing the investment in nursing. And my question is, um, what parts of the portfolio at RWJ are also um, supporting this that may not be nursing specific? Because I heard you talk about uh, expanding the boundaries, and I'm wondering uh, what other projects at RWJ would have an intended or unintended consequence to the future of nursing it's for, uh, initiative? That's easy, all of them, all of them. 
We are about improving health and health care for all Americans and creating this culture of health. So you think about every single area that we're working in, public health. Uh, who are the, what's the largest workforce in public health? And in measuring it, in practicing, in delivering public health, nurses. We're trying to reverse the epidemic of childhood obesity. Schools are central to that. Who are the leaders that change the way people think about healthy schools? Nurses. Uh, who, who are the people that parents trust when they're trying to get information about healthy uh, diets and physical activity for their kids? Often it's nursing. Quality of care, I've spoken about that all morning. If we're gonna improve the quality of care, it happens at the bedside, it happens in the boardroom, it happens at the highest levels in the C-suite. Who's really driving that? Nurses are. We, we've already talked about coverage. When we were trying to campaign, um, and I use that not in a political sense, uh, for coverage and in expanding coverage, some of the most vocal people and certainly the most credible voices, and the polls showed this over and over again, were nurses. So wherever we go and we ask ourselves, how are we going to transform our healthcare system and the quality of health that we have as a nation, nurses are central to that. So it's everywhere. It's in every single portfolio. That's why I'm here. Okay. Thank you all. You're going to have a fabulous conference. Thank you for all that you do. We really could not do it without each of you.